Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me um, a great pleasure to welcome you here uh, for the Baron de Lancey Medical Law Lecture. My name is uh, Cathy Liddell, and I am the director of the Law Faculty's uh, new Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences. Uh, along with about a dozen colleagues, uh, our centre is involved in teaching and researching um, well, quite a handful now of uh, very interesting legal and ethical issues uh, arising out of medicine and medical sciences. We are very pleased to have been asked to organise the, uh, the Hayden Delancey lectures. Uh, they've been a feature of the law faculty's calendar for a number of years and uh, they've had actually a number of distinguished speakers, um, many of whom you can find videos of on the um, Centre's new site. Our centre's particularly interested in interdisciplinary collaborations, so we are very grateful that uh, so many of you could come this evening. We know a little of your backgrounds, and I see, in fact, a number of familiar faces from the law faculty, including staff members and students, um, also a number of people from the clinical school. Um, uh, also people from other departments in the humanities and social sciences. And I'm also pleased to say from uh, the practicing uh, legal profession. Indeed, um, we have uh, with us this evening um, uh, Lord, Right Honorable Lord uh, uh, Reed here this evening. Um, as many of you will know, he is a justice of the Supreme Court and was also one of the judges uh, hearing and deciding the Montgomery case that we are discussing this evening. We're also very grateful that the trustees of the Verhaid and Delancey Trust could be here this evening uh, without the financial support of, of the trust uh, and also the um, organization that uh, one of our center members, Colm McGrath, who I think is still outside, still organizing, uh, <laughs> this evening would not nearly have been possible. So thank you. Turning now to our speaker, we have invited this year uh, Mr. James Badenoch, QC. Uh, Mr. Badenoch is a, a distinguished QC who has uh, retired recently after more than uh, 25 years uh, at the bar. 45. In, uh, 45 years at the bar in medical law. Your website wasn't updated then, <laughs> like so many of us. Um, his colleagues describe him as a barrister who has seen it all, done it all, and yet still remain tremendously respected. <laughs> and uh, he told me uh, when we were walking over here that as a younger man, uh, it was his father, um, all of them growing up in Oxford, who uh, began uh, setting up the Cambridge Clinical School. So that is quite a neat circularity and a coincidence for this evening. His last case was Montgomery against Lanarkshire Health Board, and it will be the topic of this evening's lecture. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Well, thank you very much, Cathy, and thank you to Colm, and thank you to Professor Spencer, and all those responsible for inviting me to give this distinguished, as I understand, lecture I'm afraid I'm not very distinguished, and when they told me that Lord Reed was going to be here, I, my reply by email, I think, began, no pressure then. Uh, the fact is, it's an honor to give this lecture, and a particular honor for me to know that here there are members of the clinical faculty at Cambridge Medical School, as well as uh, law students and law dons. It's true, as Cathy said, that my late father, who died in 1996, was one of the two creators, begetters, founders of the Cambridge Clinical Medical School. He'd been Dean of the Medical School or Director of Clinical Studies in Oxford. And in fact, uh, for many years, every Saturday, he came over to Cambridge, found his way somehow. And when he died, the then Dean of the Cambridge Clinical Medical School wrote to my mother with the words, we know on whose shoulders we stand. So those of you who are now studying in that clinical school have before you the son of the man, one of two men who created that 
and from which I hope you derive the benefit now. Um, Baron de, Van Hayden de Lancey, I looked up his history, a true polymath, a man of very many parts, a qualified doctor, a qualified dentist, um, a, 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 a teacher, a philanthropist, a multilingual speaker of, I think, five languages. I pale into total insignificance in his shadow, but, and I'm sure I shan't ever have a lecture named after me. It used to be a game in my family, what would you like to have named after you? A disease came high, Parkinson's. Uh, a law would perhaps be even better, Boyle's law. And we, um, uh, we even thought of a country, Rhodesia, but perhaps that's better not talked about in the modern world. But we stopped the game almost, it came to a full stop, when we learned about the great explorer Humboldt. <laughs> he didn't just have a lecture named after you or a country, or he had a glacier, a current, a mountain range, 300 species of plants, and 100 species of animal, including some of you will know Humboldt's penguin, and above all, Humboldt's hog-nosed skunk. Uh, with, an, with an eponymous animal like that, I'm sure he died happy. Anyway, I must turn to the matter in hand, and I hope you'll forgive me if I appear to some of you to talk a bit down to you, because I think the case of Montgomery needs to be set in its proper context. I pronounce it, by the way, Montgomery, because that's how the family pronounce it. It's a Scottish family, and I believe also the great Field Marshal pronounced it that way, so forgive me if you don't like it, but that's how Mrs. Montgomery pronounced her name. The decision... Uh, in that case, overturned the much-discussed and much-reviled decision in the case of Sidaway against the Board of Governors of the Bethlehem and Maudsley Hospitals. That case, as I say, had been much reviled, written about in textbooks, many chapters. It was a case in which uh, the law lords, as they then were, with the now vindicated exception, really, of Lord Scarman, but perhaps to a limited extent also Lord Templeman, had clung doggedly to the concept that in respect of the disclosure of information to patients for the purpose of their consent to medical treatment, what is known as the Bolan principle should apply, a principle which uh, we argued and which I hope to show you uh, belonged to attitudes to the doctor-patient relationship which were of a past era even then and are certainly of a past era, era now. And we argued, and the Supreme Court justices uh, agreed with us, that the Bolam test for this purpose at least, and I'll discuss the Bolam test in a minute, should be and needed to be now consigned to the dustbin of history. The principle of Bolam, and he gave his name, here's another thing, an eponymous uh, case, he gave his name, Mr. Bolam, uh, to the case and the principle which caused him to lose his claim for damages. Uh, he was a man greatly depressed. He was subject to ECT treatment. And when they applied the paddles and the shocks, he was thrown bodily from the couch onto the hard floor and broke both his femurs and was crippled for life. He uh, alleged that he should have been strapped on or sedated to prevent the spasm of muscles which threw him off the bed. And his experts said, of course he should. The defence found experts to say that they didn't dream of sedating or strapping a patient because that in itself could cause injury. It was always difficult to see what on earth that injury might be compared to being thrown bodily from the bed. But the principle uh, which was applied was summed up by the headline in the Times Law Report in 1955 to Bolam's other alter ego, the case of Hunter and Hanley in Scotland. The headline was, No Negligence Where Doctors Disagree. That, in layman's terms, sums up the Bolam uh, principle. What they decided in Sidaway was that it applied as much to decisions from the doctor about uh, what to disclose to the patient for the purpose of consent as it did to the doctor's expert decisions about diagnosis and treatment. That meant, according to Lord Diplock, who gave the leading and most robust judgment in Sidaway, that if the issue of allegedly inadequate disclosure of information to a patient was raised, on which, after all, the patient was deciding whether or not to consent to treatment, the answer to whether it was adequate and therefore negligent or not was uh, 
answered by a simple question. Was the amount of information, whether it was little or a lot, or perhaps not any, which the doctor gave, uh, sufficient to meet the approval or sanction of at least a responsible body of medical opinion, however small a minority that might be. And yet, even in 1985, when they decided that that was so, they had to acknowledge that the decision in question whether to consent is not the doctor's, it is the patient's, because it is our inalienable right, and was then and always has been, it is our inalienable right, provided we're of sound mind and conscious and capable of deciding, to decide what shall be done or not done to our own bodies. And you'll remember, the law students among you and the lawyers, that it has long been established that if there is any interference with our bodily integrity or our bodily functions by a doctor or a surgeon, that is unlawful if it is not the subject of valid consent. Uh, it must, by necessary definition, to be real, consent must, by necessary definition, to be real and valid, be the product of a free choice by the patient as part of our right to personal autonomy and self-determination. And what we asked the court in uh, Montgomery was this. What does that choice mean? What does the autonomy really amount to if the uh, decision is to be made on however much information, however little information, the doctor may choose to give you when he asks you to consent. You, you will perhaps appreciate at once that under the Bolan principle, a doctor had only to find a group of doctors who would approve, for example, that he told you nothing of the risks, and if they did approve it, he would not be found negligent. In other words, by that principle of law, the opportunity to exercise your right to self-determination was subject to information that was rationed, limited, confined, unregulated, unpredictable, subject to the personal and endlessly variable idiosyncratic whims of the given doctor. Because as many doctors as there were, you can be sure there'd be as many uh, notions of what it was right or wrong to tell you in respect of your treatment. And as the High Court of Australia had said in Rogers and Whitaker in 1992, the choice is in reality meaningless unless it's made on the basis of relevant information and advice. Because the choice to be made calls for a decision by the patient on information which is known to the medical practitioner but not to the patient, it would be illogical to hold that the amount of information to be provided by the medical practitioner can be determined from the perspective of the practitioner alone, or for that matter, of the medical profession. And to cut a very long story short, the Bolan principle had established the contrary proposition that the autonomy apparently could be limited, rationed, and regulated by whatever the doctors at their idiosyncratic whim thought right to tell you. To cut a long story short, the Supreme Court, presented with the perfect storm of facts in Mrs. Montgomery's case, accepted our arguments that the Bolan principle should not apply to information disclosure for consent, and that Sidaway had been, in 1985, wrongly decided, although it had prevailed and affected litigation for those 30 years. The true test, said the Supreme Court in Montgomery, was not one of professional approval, because unlike diagnosis and treatment, consent is a decision for the patient to make. And it requires for its reality and validity that the patient has received enough information on which to enable him to make a real or reasoned choice. The case began in Scotland and ended its route via the trial judge in Scotland and the appeal court in Scotland uh, in the Supreme Court. And um, there we were confronted with seven Supreme Court justices. I have to say I was used to one judge. I had not infrequently appeared in front of three judges in the Court of Appeal and once in the Court of Appeal in front of five judges in a case called Highland Rankin, but seven was a new experience for me. And the reason was that we had indicated in advance that we were hoping and intending to persuade them to overturn a previous decision of their predecessor, the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords. 
I hope you'll forgive me if I briefly uh, spend a little time uh, on the Bolan test. It had been, in fact, preceded in Scotland by the case which I mentioned earlier called Hunter and Hanley. I will assume your familiarity with the principle, but I think it's quite important just briefly to remind you of one of its main expositions. That was Lord Scarman in another case, Maynard against the West Midlands Regional Health Authority. He said this, and I think it is worth just citing to you, a case which is based on an allegation that a fully considered decision of two consultants in the field of their special skill was negligent, clearly presents certain difficulties of proof. It's not enough to show that there is a body of competent professional opinion which considers that theirs was a wrong decision, if there also exists a body of professional opinion equally competent which supports the decision as reasonable in the circumstances. Differences of opinion and practice exist and will always exist. In the medical, as in other professions, there is seldom any one answer exclusive of all others to problems of professional judgment. A court may prefer one body of opinion to another, but that is no basis for a conclusion of negligence. And so you see that in its purest form, the Bolan defence will exculpate doctors if they can manage to rustle together approval from at least a body of their own profession, even in cases where the facts would to a layman appear blatantly negligent. And if I may, just extremely briefly, could I tell you about a case I was in when I was a young barrister? Caesarean section, the obstetrician was holding the baby by its feet as he lifted the baby out of the abdominal and uterine incision when, before the aftercoming head came out, the uterus went into a rare phenomenon, a very sharp spasm around the baby's neck. While that was going on, the baby was certainly asphyxiating. He didn't do anything, he simply waited, holding the baby's feet, while that live, normal, healthy baby asphyxiated in his hands. Our experts said it was simple to rescue him, cut a vertical incision at right angles to the first, do it immediately, out would come the head, the baby is rescued, entirely normal and healthy, then sew up the mother's uterus. No, said professors from guides on the other side, that was an unacceptable mutilation, and it would threaten the mother's future, note the word future, fertility. And they pointed to a, a, a textbook, an old textbook called Walker and Magoo Ray, which said exactly that. So the judge said, Bolan. I was well and truly Bolan. He said the two professors and the textbook made it absolutely plain that there were two schools of thought here. It was approved by at least a body of the profession, and we lost. And that case is scarred on my soul. I should have appealed it, and I didn't. I was young and naive, and Bolan was in its pomp in those days. Had I done so, we would have arrived at the decision which eventually came in the case of Belitho, of which some of you will know, which came much later in 1998. What the court would have had to decide, it seems to me, if I'd appealed that case, although the parents, I have to tell you, wanted nothing more to do with the law at all, if I had appealed that case, we'd have got the Belitho decision. And that, you'll remember, all of you probably know this, tempers Bolan by saying this, that in rare cases, there may be an instance in which the opinion of the defending doctor, when subjected to logical analysis, fails to withstand that test. And if, but only if that is so, then the judge may reject the defendant school of thought. That would have happened in relation, I am sure you agree with me, to the facts of the case I just described about the baby trapped within the uterus. But I didn't do it, and I regret it. And Belitho was not, of course, a eureka moment in reality, because wise judges had, in fact, in my experience, for years been tempering Bolam with some kind of their own logical analysis, for otherwise no medical negligence claim would have been won before uh, Belitho. And yet some were, I can assure you. And that must, by necessary implication, involve cases in which there were two opposing expert views, and the judge in the end was happy to prefer one to the other, contrary to Bolan in its pure form. So, Diplock in Sidaway, and to a lesser extent the other law lords, apart from Lord Scarman, had said the Bolan test was the way to judge whether information disclosure was adequate. And Lord Diplock said it in the strongest terms, adding this, the only mention, the only effect that mention of risk can have on the patient's mind 
if it has any at all, can be in the direction of deterring the patient from undergoing the treatment, which in the expert opinion of the doctor, it is in the patient's interests to uh, undergo. Well, I don't need you to, me, you don't need me to tell you that that exemplifies a very condescending and very paternalistic view of the patient. But it's one which prevailed for many years, and one which was based, as I'm sure you'll agree, even the younger members of this audience, on a bygone concept of the doctor-patient relationship. The concept that the doctor exercises some God-given, slightly quasi-magical skill, which us mere mortals, the patients, are not in a position to understand, and we should not, in any sense, challenge or question what the doctor decides. Doctor knows best. The principle that says, hello, take these pills, two a day, every night, or, good morning, George, I'm going to cut your leg off. And, and, and to be perfectly frank, there were many doctors who thought that that was, of course, entirely proper and were um, not happy at being questioned in any sense by their patients. The older generation still in this country will, I think, uh, to some extent suffer from this doctor knows best concept, but it was well out of date by the time Belitha came along and certainly uh, by the time Montgomery was decided. I should add, and I'll take it very briefly, that Lord Diplock made a special exception for himself in his judgment. He explained and said in terms that although patients generally would not, should not be told and they'd only be frightened off the treatment they would have and therefore doctors can decide how little or how much, he said, but when it comes to warning about risks, the kind of training and experience that a judge will have undergone at the bar makes it natural for him to say, brackets, correctly, it is it is my right to decide whether any particular thing is done to my body. And I, Lord Diplock, want to be fully informed of any risks there may be involved, <laughs> of which I am not already aware from my general knowledge as a highly educated man of experience, so that I may form my own judgment as to whether to refuse the advised treatment or not. Now, We've laughed at that. We can't help it. It belongs to another era, doesn't it? But we asked in Montgomery, and the Supreme Court justices clearly took it on board because they cited that passage in their decision. Lord Reed and Lord Kerr wrote the opinion of the, uh, the principal opinion in that case. Uh, re the, the Supreme Court justices recognised that there was something entirely unacceptable in the modern world in differentiating between Lord Diplock on the one hand, who was entitled to full information, and the rest of us, the mere mortals, the great unwashed, who should not have access to that information for fear that we might fail to understand it or be frightened by it sufficiently to jump out of bed and run down the street refusing our treatment. So, let me just move on. The fallacy and illogicality of, of Sidaway is important for us to get a grip on to understand how Montgomery presented the right opportunity at the right time to change the law. The uh, opinion of Lord Bridge uh, uh, allowed uh, what we said was an illogical exception to this rule. He said that a doctor would have a duty to disclose a risk, even in Sidaway's day, this is, back in 1985, he would have a duty to disclose a risk if the patient actually asked uh, uh, about it or if the risk amounted to what he said would be a significant risk, namely a risk of the order of 10%. Well, as for, the, um, as for those exceptions which, which Lord Bridge allowed, I, I, I expect you can see through both of them at once. Firstly, uh, it has to be said about picking a percentage for the risk you must tell your patient about, that it may very well be, if you were in the patient's shoes, and many of you will have been, that a very small risk of extremely serious harm might be something of which you wish to take very careful account, whereas the 10% or even greater risk of very minor harm would be something which would be immaterial to your considerations when asked to consent or not. Similarly, in relation to the suggestion that if a patient asks a question directly about risk, the doctor must then 
give a truthful answer. We, and I'm sure that you will agree with me, argued that that too was illogical and unworthy of modern day consideration. How is it, we ask, that when the patient dares to ask a question, it amplifies or changes the duty of the doctor to provide information? Why is it that the information that the patient thus seeks by asking now becomes information which it is necessary for the uh, doctor to supply to the patient, when up to that point it has not been? Why is it that it becomes relevant and material and important to disclose, simply because the patient has had the curiosity or the temerity to ask the doctor about it? If this, I think I call it transubstantiation of information in my, in my submissions, if this transubstantiation of information, which is previously irrelevant to the patient's decision, into material that is now relevant, it assumes uh, that contrary to the principle of clinical judgment as the yardstick under Bolan, that the yardstick is in fact the patient's own perceptions. And that, we argued in Montgomery, should be the key to the test applied to disclosure. The patient's own perceptions. Could I just pause a moment? Um, at the risk of sounding pious, it seemed uh, to us, and it may seem to you, that the Bolan principle applied to disclosure fails to take account of what a patient really is. A patient is a human being, a person who is, by necessary definition, suffering a health problem, probably anxious, even afraid, having personal characteristics, timidity, intelligence, whatever it might be, having responsibilities outside hospital, a home life, perhaps a family, views and perceptions, hopes and wishes of his own. A patient is such a creature. But the Bolan principle and the doctor's condescending uh, permission simply to choose whether to tell you anything or not about what he proposes to do to you treats you in a way which I hope certainly my late father would strongly have deprecated, and I'm sure you do too, treats that patient as if he is just an interesting broken piece of machinery upon which the doctor has the right to practice his arcane skills. And that is at the heart, philosophically as well as morally and legally, of our objection to the Bolan principle being allowed to govern what you're told. But the key fallacy in Sidaway which we argued and which the Supreme Court agreed, is in eliding the two types of decision the doctor is making. The first is diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and the second is what is the appropriate form of treatment. That, of course, comes from the doctor's learning and experience in his medical profession. But the other decision, which by Sidaway was lumped in with those two decisions, is entirely the patient to make. The patient has the right to determine what shall be done or not done with his body. And remember this, that that patient, however stupid he may be, has in fact the right to decline treatment altogether, provided he is of adult years and sound mind, even if that is a very foolish decision and to the detriment of his health. Indeed, you will have read about cases, and they are not unfortunately uncommon, in which people refuse blood transfusions, for example, on religious grounds, people who refuse force feeding, people who insist that they want no more cancer therapy and wish instead to die. These are cases in ordinary daily life. When my chambers was asked whether we would agree, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to us, we were asked would we agree when they had occasion to contest the giving of a blood transfusion to a child, whether we would be willing to act for them? We were all brought up, as the bar is, or ought still to be, on the basis that we do not judge the client, that we are not allowed to reject anyone's case simply because it is in some sense morally repugnant to us. 
And we listened to the Jehovah's Witnesses who came to see us. They said this, we believe that if our child is given a blood transfusion, he will go straight to hell when he dies. We believe that. And when we are asked to consign our children to hell, fire and damnation for all eternity, we don't want the doctors to do it. And they said to us, you may not agree with us, and you may find our beliefs repugnant, but we believe it. Will you be prepared to argue our case? And of course we had to say, much as it might go against the grain for us, yes, we would. How did I come to be in Montgomery? It's a Scottish case, and they have barristers, and in the case, barristers of the highest caliber. Well, the answer is simple. I had become known, I think I have to say notorious, for my lectures and articles in which I have long contended that Bolam should be consigned to the dustbin of history in all medical cases. In simple terms, my contention has been for some time that you should restore to the judge the normal judicial function in medical cases, which he enjoys in all other cases involving expert opinion, namely, to discriminate in his mind, having listened carefully between two opposing expert cases, and to decide which one he prefers, and to decide the case accordingly. He does that with the designing of bridges and buildings. He does that with the steering and running of tankers in the high seas. He does that, bring it back to simple terms, in relation to the driving of cars. The judge's function in those respects is perfectly well established and normal. But only nowadays in the medical sphere is he effectively disqualified from exercising that function. Because no negligence if doctors disagree, as that Times headline put it. And so there it was, I was known for these views. And Montgomery's facts presented the perfect storm in which we had an opportunity to tap, attack Bolam, at least in that context of medical care. And briefly, I think, if you don't mind, I'll tell you the rather distressing facts of Montgomery. Some of you will know them very well. Please forgive me, but I'd like you just to bear them in mind. Mrs. Montgomery was an intelligent graduate in molecular biology. She was very small in stature, just over five foot tall, and pregnant for the first time. There was a feature of her case, I'm going to take this quickly, which made her pregnancy, as was agreed, high risk. She was a long-standing insulin-dependent diabetic. And the odd thing about such women is this. Their fetuses often grow excessively large in the womb. And one extra feature they have, they tend to put a large layer of deposit of fat about the fetal shoulders. Don't ask me why they do that or what quirk of nature allows it, but that is what happens. With the consequence, especially in a very small woman who is diabetic with a very large child, that there is a very particular risk in delivering vaginally in normal in the normal way. That is this. The risk is called shoulder dystocia. When the baby's head is out, sometimes the shoulder may become stuck behind the mother's symphysis pubis, which is the uh, frontal bone across the front of the female pelvis. And if it does so, it's a dire obstetric emergency. In about 10% of diabetic mothers with macrosomic children who labour, who are allowed to labour, it will happen. When it happens, crisis. I've seen a film of it as it happens. The room fills up. Suddenly they call the paediatrician, the neonatologist, the anaesthetist, the consultant obstetrician. They call extra midwives. The mother is pulled to the edge of the bed. Her knees are thrust back over her chest in the, called the Roberts Maneuver. The Maneuver would be a good one to have named after me. I haven't thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> the Roberts Maneuver. And they try sometimes by suprapubic pressure with her knees back on her chest to push that shoulder down. Mostly, they succeed, but it's a horrible experience for everyone. If they succeed partially, the baby is saved from asphyxiation. Because the great danger in doing this phenomenon is that the cord is occluded between the baby's shoulder and the mother's bony pelvis. Even if they succeed in extracting the baby fairly quickly, there is another crisis which can occur, which is that the brachial plexus is avulsed from the spinal column. The nerves which control the function and sensation of the arm, unfortunately, in rescuing children from shoulder dystocia, 
it's a phenomenon that happens. They're left with a flail arm. And I had a client years ago who told me that he'd even started cooking his arm on the stove, on the gas stove, and only realized he was cooking it when he smelled his own burnt flesh. It's a useless, sensationless arm. A bad thing in itself. But worst of all, if the delay occurs in rescuing the shoulder dystocia and getting the baby out, he will asphyxiate and suffer brain damage or death. So that was the risk. About 10% of labouring mothers who are diabetic have that phenomenon. Of them, only a small percentage come to real grief, perhaps 1% or 2%. But in advance, you have no idea which of the 10% it's going to be that comes to grief. And of course, it was poor Mrs. Montgomery's baby that did. What happened? She was very anxious. Because she was anxious and tiny and with a big baby, they exceptionally called her a high risk, and they exceptionally measured the size of her baby fortnightly by ultrasound. Any of you who've had babies know that fortnightly ultrasound measurements is a very extreme step. And they plotted the graph, and the baby was getting bigger and bigger. And Mrs. Montgomery was frightened. She asked, as the transcript showed, more than once, would she, this tiny woman, be able to push this big baby, as she knew it was, out safely? That, you may think, was, in layman's terms, a question specifically directed to the risks that she confronted given her special case. So, what happened? Dr. McClellan did not tell her anything about the risk. Dr. McClellan ordained that she would be induced, her labour would be induced. Dr. McClellan, in evidence, announced, uh, this is a female obstetrician in Scotland of some experience, announced, uh, as in her evidence, that she would allow Mrs. Uh, Montgomery to labour. She also said, in her own words, that she reassured her that if trouble arose in labour, they could go to caesarean section. She told her nothing about the extremely <coughs> hazardous risks of shoulder dissocia at all. She didn't offer her caesarean section because, as she said later, when you offer these women a caesarean section, they take it. They accept it. <laughs> And it's not in the maternal interests, in her opinion, that they, m women should have caesarean sections. Um, l let me cut, cut to the chase. Mrs. Montgomery had her labour induced. So, in effect, labour in this tiny woman with the big it was imposed upon her. Prostaglandin was inserted into the vagina, which is a hormonal process, to start labour artificially. She went into labour. Now, remember Dr. McClellan had told her that if a problem arose during labour, you would go to cesarean section. A problem did arise in labour. Predictably, labour became obstructed. The baby was very big, after all, and she was tiny. But, even then, Dr. McClellan did not go to cesarean section. Progress stopped. She administered syntocinone by intravenous drip a drug which augments the contractions of the uterus and forces the baby down the birth canal. The tragic thing happened. It succeeded. Out came the baby's head, his shoulders stuck, and he was now asphyxiating. Tragically, and I'm sorry to labour this, but I do think it's important to know the facts. The room filled with people. They tried the McRoberts manoeuvre. It failed. They tried superfluid pressure. It failed. And then I'm sorry to tell you uh, that... In fact, caesarean section was impossible. Once the head is out and the shoulder is stuck, there is something called the Zaffanelli manoeuvre, which in very, very distant past and remotely people have tried to push the baby back up into the uterus and cut the mother open. Frankly, in the obstetricians I've talked to say that's utterly, utterly out of the question. So what did she do? She tried to cut through the mother's synthesis pubis, separating the two halves of the pelvis, which in the third world is a method of achieving uh, release of a baby where they can't do a cesarean section. But she hadn't got the right kit, so she only managed to cut halfway through the mother's symphysis pubis. And then, using forceps, she managed to pull the baby out. He was by now severely brain damaged from asphyxia. He had an avulsed brachial plexus, and he was crippled in his arm for life. The case turned on a number of features of, uh, 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 which you could imagine. But uh, put it, put it, to cut a long story short, it was defended on every front. Under the old law, she'd asked questions, and quite simply, she should have been given a truthful answer about the risks. Under the old law, the risk of 10%, Lord Bridge had said it, 
was 10%, she should have been told about it. You may think that even under the old law, this was a case in which they should not have defended. But they did. They defended on every count. They said it was perfectly all right and called expert through it not to tell her anything about the risks. It was perfectly all right to in induce her labour without offering her the option of cesarean section. They said it was perfectly all right not to go to section during the labour. And they uh, it depended. They, they proceeded entirely on the Bolan defence. Inexplicable, as it seems, to the lawyers and doctors to whom I've spoken about this case and who I've heard talking about it. They defended it to the hilt. And the judges in Scotland, regrettably, went along with the defence. They managed to agree with the submissions of the defending lawyers that when she said, will I be able to push this baby out safely, this big baby, that that was not a question about risk, but only, as they put it, an expression of generalised anxiety. I asked my wife what she thought of that. She's a veteran of some numbers of childbirth. And she said, well, I can't think of a much clearer way to ask about the risks of getting a big baby out for a small pelvis than to say, will I be able to push it safely out? But there we are. Anyway, the end of the story was that the judges in Scotland, both the trial judge um, and the three appeal court judges, uh, ruled against Mrs. Montgomery's claim. And the most surprising feature of all was this. Mrs. Montgomery was said by Dr. McClellan to be very frightened of vaginal birth. So much so she needed to be reassured, and so much so, said Dr. McClellan, she didn't even do the last measurement by ultrasound before she induced her, because she knew the baby was getting bigger and it would only fr frighten her more. Uh, the, the, the whole uh, the problem in the case seems to have stemmed from a purest application of Bolan and a very strange interpretation of what actually happened in the case. What we were left with, therefore, when we arrived at uh, the Supreme Court was the perfect storm of facts in which to argue that she should have been given full information and offered the opportunity of cesarean section. And here came the oddest feature of the case uh, as it was decided in Scotland. Mrs. Dr. McLean said that if she'd offered cesarean section, Mrs. Montgomery would have accepted it. And that's why she didn't offer it. <laughs> Mrs. Montgomery said, and you can tell it must have been true, if, I, if I'd been given the opportunity of cesarean section, I'd have taken it. The claimants, or pursuer, as they're called in Scotland, expert witnesses said, well, in our experience, if you offer a small diabetic mother with a big baby of cesarean section and tell her about shoulder dystocia, she goes for section. And, not surprisingly, the defence experts both said, if you offer a woman in this situation a cesarean section, they accept it and they go for it. And every obstetrician I've talked to in the South since the case came on has said, everyone has said to me, in these circumstances, that not only would I offer it, I would actually advise it. I've heard a yes in the background. I see Kevin Dalton there, and I'm not sure if he's nodding, but actually advise it. Well, the defence argued that if she'd been offered it, she'd have refused it. And the judges agreed. The judge at trial found that she would have refused it if offered it, and the three appeal court judges thought that was a very sound finding. What to make of it? Well, we uh, made enough of the facts, and I've detained you long enough with them, and that they are, as you, I think you'll agree, they're facts which have a very uh, painful ring uh, to them. The influential case law showed that only in English law of the developed world were we still clinging to the professional approval principle of disclosure for consent. And it's fair to say that in the American case of Canterbury and Spence, in 1964, the American judges had said this, the respect for the patient's right of self-determination on particular therapy demands a standard set by law for physicians rather than one which physicians may or may not impose upon themselves. 
And from the famous decision in Rebel and Hughes in Canada in 1980, both these cited by the Supreme Court justices, came this. Expert medical evidence is, of course, relevant to findings as to risks that reside in or are a result of recommended surgery or other treatment. It will also have a bearing on their materiality. But this is not a question that is to be concluded on the basis of expert medical evidence alone. The issue under consideration is a different issue from that involved, where the question is whether the doctor carried out his professional activities by applicable professional standards. What is under consideration here is the patient's right to know what risks are involved in undergoing or foregoing certain surgery or other treatment. And it is true that we lag behind other American, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, and all other European jurisdictions in clinging to Bolan for this test. Shamefully, as we would say, and as I effectively, I think, was saying in the Supreme Court. And remember, even as long ago as 1914, the very famous American Justice Cardozo, in a case called Schloendorf, a New York hospital, had said this, every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. And as I stand in Cambridge, I think I should cite the six-volume textbook entitled The Comparative, Comparative Studies in the Development of the Law of Torts in Europe, published by Cambridge University Press in, 19, in 2010. In the section Development of Medical Liability, which is edited by Dr. Edward Hudius, the editor himself wrote this. Should doctors, this is 2010, should doctors inform their patients as to the risks of the treatment they propose? It nowadays seems a truism to say that they should. And yet, there is one jurisdiction in the European Union where the law is, or at least until recently was, less settled than other member states. And that, he wrote, to the surprise of many, is English law. And he then cited Sidaway. I won't read out the passages, but we were able to point in the Supreme Court to passages from decided cases since Sidaway in which very distinguished judges indeed had clearly pointed the way to what we were arguing must be the case in relation to consent. Lord Wolfe, in a very well-known case called Pierce in 1999, had said that in his view the law was that if there's a significant risk which would affect the judgment of a reasonable patient, then in the normal course the patient should be told of it. That was as long ago as 1999. And in the very much disputed case of Chester and Afshar, and most of you will know uh, Chester and Afshar, even perhaps first-year law students, in 2004, Lord Bingham and Lord Stain both effectively said the same thing. And indeed, Lord Stain said that in modern law, medical paternalism no longer rules, and a patient has a prima facie right to be informed by a surgeon of a small but well-established risk of serious injury as a result of surgery. Well, those cases were influential indeed when we appeared in front of Lord Reed and his brother judges, and so they should have been. You may say, small wonder that the facts in Mrs. Montgomery's case were considered by the likes of me the perfect storm of facts to raise this issue. And small wonder that the English law has finally and very belatedly caught up with everybody else's law in the developed Western world. So what is the Montgomery decision? I come to the important features now, and I'm sorry if I've detained you perhaps a little too long in the build-up to it. But I hope you think that looking at the context in which the decision was made is a very important thing because we argued and the Supreme Court justices agreed that this case illustrated so clearly and so well why the principle of the Bolan test for consent was wrong. Now, what the Montgomery principle expressed by Lord Reed and Lord Kerr in the leading opinion that they gave, or judgment as we now call them, we used to call them opinions, 
I, I should say just in passing, when it comes to Lord Diplock, whom I've quoted at length, when I was a young lawyer and was in some difficulty with a very vexed area of the law, I have to say I didn't always rush to Lord Diplock's judgments for enlightenment. <laughs> the one that I remember as a young barrister finding wonderfully clear and helpful was the Scottish law lord, Lord Reed. Spelt differently from the present Lord Reed, but I know that the present Lord Reed is in that tradition. And Lord Reed, I commend him, whenever you encounter him in the older cases, in the decisions of the House of Lords, if you're law students, do remember that. He is a, always a model of clarity and certainty. And, and that is what we look for in our Supreme Court Justice now, and what I am not at all embarrassed to say we found in the decision of Lord Reed and Lord Kerr in Montgomery. What they have decided is this, <coughs> that the test now for information disclosure should mirror what has for a long time been the strong and mandatory guidance of the General Medical Council to its doctors. They register all the doctors, their guidance in this respect has been mandatory and it has existed in those mandatory terms since 1998 and indeed in a slightly less forceful form since uh, about 1990. So the law was behind the GMC's mandatory guidance. What they have said is that the pa patient centered, sorry, that the patient centered test is now the way in which the court should uh, judge whether or not uh, appropriate information has been given. The doctor must, and here comes the crunch, take reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative or variant treatments. And the test of materiality formulated by Lord Reed and Lord Kerr and the Supreme Court Justices unanimously in their decision in Montgomery is this. The test of materiality is this. Would in the circumstances of the particular case a reasonable person in the patient's position be likely to attach significance to the risk? Pausing there, that's an objective look at a reasonable patient in, in the patient's position. Or the doctor is or should reasonably be aware that the particular patient would be likely to attach significance to it. Now, I just want to stress for a moment the word reasonable. The key to all this, contrary to some of the bleating from a very small minority of doctors that has been aimed at me and at Lord Reed and the Supreme Court in Montgomery, the key to it is going to be those words reasonable person in the patient's position, reasonably aware. Risks attaching to any treatment or reasonable alternative or variant treatments. We can dispense with the whining complaints that doctors will have to reel off an entire catalogue of ridiculously tiny risks which have been known to occur once in Saudi Arabia and twice in Alaska. As the Supreme Court Justice said, Lord Reed said in his judgment, the doctors are not therefore expected to bombard the patient with immense detail. Quite the contrary. The test is, what would a reasonable person in this situation be likely to attach significance to? The doctor will simply have to take an intelligent and rational look at what that reasonable person would want and need to know. And then to look at the patient himself or herself, because patients have individual special characteristics which may influence what to that patient would be considered material. The patient-centered test means what it says. And remember this, I have not yet been able to go to court to argue that the Bolan principle should not apply in cases concerning diagnosis and treatment. I think my almost total retirement now at the age of 70, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, I promised my wife I'd retire at 70. I made the promise when it seemed a long way off. <laughs> and last July it came to pass. And uh, the divorce petition is in preparation if I don't keep my, if I don't keep my promise. <laughs> but 
the truth is this, and I wonder what you're thinking, and I'm going to invite at the end questions about this. Do you think that, in contrast to all other fields of expertise, the medical profession should still be enabled by our law to cling on to a principle which makes them judges in their own cause? Or do you think, like I do, that whereas professional approval or professional uh, uh, agreement with what was done or not done will always be very relevant to a judicial decision about whether it was negligent or not, it should not in any case be necessarily decisive. And as I've said to you, in its purest form, in Bolam, it is necessarily decisive. As in that terrible case I described of the baby being lifted out by its feet from the incision in the uterus. I think that is a topic on which if I was going to stay at the bar, I would want to take further. And, and may I just pause in that regard and say this. Lord Justice Jackson gave uh, a lecture entitled the Peter Taylor Memorial Lecture uh, a year ago in London. Lord Justice Jackson is not the most popular judge among the legal profession. As some of you in this room will know, he is the one who has made a huge onslaught on the fees which lawyers charge and the costs that they can run up. And it is suggested in more quarters than one that Lord Justice Jackson's experience of the sort of work that most jobbing lawyers do was limited. He was uh, an Olympian at the bar. He is the author of Powell and Jackson on Professional Negligence. And his views of what it's like to conduct litigation may be very different from the experience of most lawyers uh, in, on the ground. But nevertheless, he gave that lecture a year ago in which he discussed professional negligence liability. And in it he said this, that Bolam has become less and less defensible over the years, that it doesn't any longer uh, can be considered to apply to any other professions or expertise, and it's been under continuous attack in medicine. He said in Montgomery, the invaders have breached the walls of Bolan. And he added that in years to come, he foresaw that attacks would continue, that Bolan, the onslaught on Bolan, would be pursued. And I can tell you this, that's certainly true. And I wonder whether you think it's right that it should fall, because I certainly do. And I come from an entirely medical family. Not only was my father, dean, well, Director of Clinical Studies, they call it at Oxford, knighted by the Queen for services to medicine, but the following of my relatives are doctors or surgeons. Father, grandfather, two great uncles, five uncles and seven cousins. <laughs> Both sides of my family are doctors. My mother says that when I was a little boy, I used to say, when I'm a doctor, because, because I thought that when you grew up, you were a doctor. <laughs> and so... I've given a lecture in the past entitled, I Sue Doctors, Why Do I Sue Doctors? Should I Sue Doctors? Which, of course, raises one of the central issues which Bolam was intended to defend doctors against, which is the kind of wholesale uh, uh, litigation factor which is said in America to lead to too much defensive medicine. That's an issue which, again, as particularly long, young law students, you will need to confront. Is it necessary to protect doctors by the strange, exceptional and unique Bolan principle, or should we scrap it? Well, my family, whenever I mentioned any of my cases, anonymised, of course, to them, tended to say, sue the bastards. <laughs> 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 um, because they wanted the maintenance of very high standards, and they wanted to know that tort law would apply as much to doctors as in surgeons as it does to others. After all, um, as many have pointed out, uh, tort law, unhappy though it may be for the person on the wrong end of it, is there to regulate uh, any behaviours in our daily life which may impact adversely on our fellow man. And tort law applies across the board to us when we drive our cars, chop down trees, to people who design bridges, drive boats, and so on. Tort law has an important function in any civilised society of regulating behaviours which may affect others, of setting and policing the standards which the courts throughout history have done for our civilised society. 
and for ensuring that those who do act in ways which are dangerous to others have in their mind's eye the possibility of the sanction of the law. And yet Bolan protects doctors from it in a most extraordinary way. What are the problems that have arisen since Montgomery? I've got a little time to discuss them, have I not? Just a few minutes. The problems that have arisen as doctors see them are, firstly, the suggestion that it applies to doctors a split duty of care and a split standard of care. In other words, that they have to wrestle with the idea that on the one hand they have the professional standard when it comes to their decisions about diagnosis and treatment, but on the other, the kind of reasonable man or reasonable patient test which applies to how they describe what they're doing to the patient. I've had that suggested and read it suggested as a bad thing. But I do it, or was doing it as a lawyer, every day. I decide for my client what the right course to take in, let us say, the litigation I'm conducting. I do that on the basis of the professional skills and learning that I have. And then, because of course I can't proceed with any further steps without the instructions of my client, I set about explaining to my client in terms that I think he will understand and appreciate what it is I'm advising and why, what the risks are and what the possible alternatives may be, including, for example, discontinuing his litigation, abandoning it. So I do it every day. The plumber does it. He comes in, he looks at what's wrong with your plumbing, and he knows what's wrong with it and what he wants to do with it from his special skill and expertise. But before you're prepared to say, go ahead and I'll pay you for it, he has to explain it to you. The split standard is no problem at all, and nor should it be considered such, nor is the reasonable man test, unless you disagree with me, nor is the reasonable patient test a problem, admitting, of course, as I must, that the reasonable patient in the judge's mind may well be himself, <laughs> and the doctor's uh, estimate of the reasonable patient may well be himself. But these are things which uh, I would suggest present no real problem in real life at all for intelligent doctors who apply their rational thought to the problem in hand. As for the special risks which apply to given patients, in my case of Birch against University College Hospitals NHS Trust, I commend a reading of Birch to you before Montgomery was decided. Mrs. Birch was a diabetic who'd had a number of uh, vascular problems with her vision in the past, They'd been met with what's called watch and wait, and they'd gone away quite um, uh, harmlessly. She had come in with another one with a slight hint of something more serious. But it was almost certain, of course, that it was just another diabetic vascular problem, for she too was a diabetic. She had to be investigated, but unfortunately she fell among the surgeons at Queen Square, not the physicians. And they gave her the uh, invasive catheter angiogram, which you push into the groin and you push the wire up, into the heart or even into the carotids in the neck, and it carries a risk of stroke, thrombus and stroke. And in her case, being a diabetic, there is learning that suggests the risk was greater for her than for others. She could have had an MRI angiogram with no invasion and no risk. And they didn't give her the option, they didn't tell her the alternative, they just, bang, in they went with the catheter angiogram. And she had a stroke, paralyzed down one side. And the judge said, in that case, which is in 2004, that, of course, the doctors should have given her the alternatives and discussed it with her. So there's a special feature of the case. Don't forget that the subjective part of the Montgomery test requires that. Look at the given patient. Anything special about this patient? The court, law lords have said that if the patient expresses a strong and expressed and clear wish not to be told anything, you may go ahead. I advise the doctors be careful about that if there's a really serious risk of serious harm you may want to tell them anyway, even if they say, I don't want to hear it, doc. Over to you. So what else has exercised the doctors? This is something you should consider carefully. Firstly, the concern that patients are, in general, uh, too stupid, too inattentive, too forgetful, or I've heard it said, too foreign in some London hospitals uh, to be capable of, make, of understanding what is said to them by the doctors or making a reasoned decision and that the doctor is uniquely placed to make decisions for patients and therefore should be allowed to ration and therefore doctor knows best. The answer to this is that in the absence of valid consent, it's unlawful to do anything to these patients, so you're going to have to 
make sure that you learn, if you're not good at it, as the law lord said in Montgomery, you've got to learn to convey difficult concepts simply in a way that patients can understand. Secondly, I have to say, and this is true, that doctors have a very great shortage of time. Both the GP who has a few minutes for his consultation and the hospital doctor who has, I understand, often just as few. They're worried that there isn't time to achieve the proper balance of information to patients. And to them I say, I'm sorry, it's a fundamental human right. Indeed, Article 8 was invoked in Montgomery and referred to in the Supreme Court Justice's uh, judgment. It is a fundamental human right that we determine what shall be done with our own body. Now, there may be those among you who think, no, doctor knows best has its place. They are uniquely placed to decide what's best for us. Let them do it, because otherwise, when they tell us about it and ask us to think, it'll only get muddled up and we'll make silly decisions. That's a something which we could debate. But my view is they've got to get on with it and make time somehow, and the NHS is going to have to suffer a sea change. What about uncertainty? Now, Lord Reed and Lord Kerr acknowledge what the defendants and doctors claim, which is that the new test gives uncertainty to those of us in the population who are considering consenting or not consenting, and to doctors about the test which will be applied. If I may say so, the real uncertainty which mattered was the uncertainty for you and me as the patients. The uncertainty was perfectly plain before Montgomery, and it was this. You had no idea what sort of doctor was confronting you when he said, I'm going to cut your leg off. You didn't know whether he was among that small school of doctors who might take the view that it's better not really to tell you anything because you're probably too stupid to understand. Or he might be, and it was lottery which doctor you got, one of those who thought to sit down and tell you everything that mattered about what he was going to do with you. It was a lottery. There was no predictability at all and no certainty. And you know, in legal principle in this country, it has always been held that one of the sacred principles of society is that we should have some certainty about what to expect from the law. So, unpredictability and uncertainty was a feature of the idiosyncratic whim of doctors if that was the test for whether they had to tell you or not. Now, I have to say that I've gone on perhaps rather too long, but clearly there are major uh, considerations for you as lawyers and for you as doctors and for the academics to consider here. Uh, I don't like the Bolan test. You've got that message loud and clear. I, 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 I was talking to Dr. Cathy Liddell beforehand and she raised me something which I, I'm afraid I, I wasn't really able to answer, which is, does it apply to medical research? All I felt able to say, and it's a topic which we might want to discuss, is that it seemed to me it would certainly apply to doctors who are submitting uh, guinea pig patients to trials. And we've had in recent times some very unpleasant cases where trials have led to terrible hardship and even death. Whether it would apply more generally to research doctors in other sorts of activity, I, I, I have not yet had occasion to encounter. What about nurses? What about midwives? What about other health professionals who now take on a lot of paramedics, as Cathy Liddell raised with me, people who take on quasi-medical roles. Where does it end? Where do we limit it? I have to say that in modern times, Bolam, in my experience, has effectively been limited to doctors and surgeons. But technically, I suppose, it would be arguable that it applied to those other quasi-medical functions. I, I, I think I've gone on long enough but I hope I've raised enough topics to interest you, and I hope that it's caught your imagination that the barristers, the jobbing barristers, a long way from the groves of Academe, have, in some instances, to take account of very, very deep and philosophical questions. The status of a patient, the moral position of doctor when he's handling his patient, and so many considerations about what is good for patients and what is good for for society. Could I end by just telling you there is something named after the Badenoch family. Um, it, I'm afraid it's a piece of kit used in male urogenital surgery. <laughs> and it's called the Badenoch pull-through. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think I'd better stop. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much. My colleague, Dr. Cathy Liddell, asked me if I would make a vote of thanks and then also um, share question and answers, though I'm quite sure Mr. Badenoch is quite capable of uh, deciding which questions to answer himself from his very spirited performance. Cathy also asked if I'd say who I am. Um, well, I'm here partly because I am at least till the end of next week, the chairman of the managers of the Cambridge for Hayden Delancey Fund, in which capacity may I add my thanks uh, to Cathy's thanks to the Jersey trustees and to bid them heartily welcome. And uh, of course, it's thanks to the generosity of that fund years ago that we're able to run these lectures. Secondly, I was involved in that because until I retired in 2013, I used to lecture in all of this, and all these cases that Mr. Medinock was telling us about popped up like old friends when he was mentioning them again. But I also thought how his excellent lecture chimed in with a number of things that have come up in other lectures in this series that have been given. We heard a lecture from Baroness Butler's loss, which involved a number of questions of consent and actually touched upon some of those Jehovah's Witnesses cases. We heard last year from Professor Mavis from the Netherlands all about uh, euthanasia on assisted dying in the Netherlands, which involved questions of consent. We've had a lecture from Professor Lachman, which, about, which had touched on questions of defensive medicine and we had another lecture some years ago now about expert evidence. So that spirited lecture ties in extremely well, and thank you. When I read the Bedenock case, I couldn't believe the Scottish judges had been so stupid as actually to decide it the way they had on the astonishing facts. I would have thought if any case deserved to be won even under Sidaway, that was a case that the client should have won. I was last night talking to somebody who used to practice in this area, who's now a judge, whose father was a lawyer, who tends to go in families like being doctors does, I think, and he said, my father used to say, uh, take care of the facts and the law will take care of itself. And I would have thought that this case was the classic case where that was so. Um, if I were in Italy making a vote of thanks, I would have to repeat the lecture in order to show I paid good attention, but we're not. Um, we're just in England, and so all I have to do is to say, from the bottom of my heart, how much I enjoyed it, and to tell the first-year students how useful I'm sure they're going to find it as well, and to say how much I agree with his praise of two lords, Reed, one who gave the judgment here, and also the old one whose judgments I used to like to read when I was a student too. So thank you once again. Um, let's show our appreciation and then the questions. <laughs>